Welcome to this week's episode of Bravo and Blaze with Jenny Blaze. I have a whole set of notes for my review and recap of the last episode of The Traders. I cried three times. But since we have so many others recapping the show and we have our upcoming finale and reunion to watch tonight, I've decided to just focus on one interview because there are a lot of things that were surprising to me and truly touched my heart. But before I discuss that, make sure you are watching The Traders on Peacock. The finale episode and reunion of season two in the U.S. is released tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. Hopefully I get this out before then. So normally I do a recap of the show and I've been going through all the ancillary podcast episodes, talking traders, Johnny Bananas, Death Taxes and Bananas, and also Dan Giesling's podcast. And I was surprised this week because I listened to, I did everything. I did the recap. I basically wrote two shows this week, but I wrote the recap. I listened to Talking Traders. I listened to Johnny Bananas podcast. And I, as soon as I started Dan Giesling's interview with Kevin Kreider, I think it's Kreider. I don't know if it's Kreider or Kreider, but he's from Bling Empire and obviously from the Traders. I completely switched gears and I just want to focus on this interview because like I said, there are things that were very surprising and made me understand Kevin even more than you know, what we learned about him on Bling Empire. So I know we all hate Dan Giesling, but he had a really great interview with Kevin Greeter of Bling Empire and his castmate on The Traders. I don't have a full review on Bling Empire to link you all back to, but I was all in on that show. What drew me in initially was the filthy wealth that we got to see. And the Asian representation, obviously. I'm half Korean, half Caucasian. My mother was born and raised in South Korea. My father was born and raised in upstate New York. He's super white. But what intrigued me further when I started watching Bling Empire was Kevin's background, specifically. And if you haven't watched Bling Empire, Kevin is kind of the center of that show, which is odd because he's the only one who's not filthy rich. But everyone else on the cast, they're from LA. They are literally filthy rich, not literally, but they are rich, rich Asians. And Kevin's background, Kevin is an adopted Korean to Caucasian parents and grew up in Pennsylvania. That part intrigued me because my mother actually started a church when I was young, a Korean church, and they worked with Parsons, which is an adoption agency, which is also the first adoption agency in the U.S. that arranged adoptions from South Korea to the United States about, I would say, like maybe 40 years ago, I would guess. What they wanted to do during these adoptions was to try to maintain a connection to the Korean culture for, for these adopted children so that as they are growing up, they have that option to you know have some kind of connection. And all this goes back to me, right? <laughs> this is problem, please. Anyone who has a podcast, a solo podcast, definitely exhibits traits of narcissism. But we use it for good here, okay? Even though I had this strong Korean upbringing through my mother's church, I still went to a predominantly white school. The Asian joke started when I was in elementary school. And I remember this one kid said to me something like, what did you eat for breakfast? Tofu? And I remember being like, huh? Did I? I like, didn't understand that he was like trying to make a joke about my culture. And I think like my friend heard and told on him or something, but I was like, oh, oh I don't know. <laughs> what's going on? Or during high school, there were literally people who would, you know, what I, what they considered at the time, joking, they would jokingly call me Korea as if that was my name. And looking back now, I see so many microaggressions and blatant discriminatory behavior. And that goes on both sides, my Caucasian side and my Korean side. But anyways, there were like maybe three adopted Koreans that I went to school with. 
And one of them wound up being my really good friends. And he turned into my high school boyfriend. I remember he would open up to me about how being adopted affected him personally. So seeing Kevin on Bling Empire was really fascinating to me because obviously I know people like him. But what I didn't know about Kevin was all of the struggles he's endured throughout his life. On Bling Empire, he finally opens up about his drinking problem in season two, I think. I remember being like, whoa, how did this get left out? Why are we just finding this out now? Like, I want to hear about that. And something about his transparency about it all was very inspiring to me and very touching. He even started a non-alcoholic canned beverage called Sans, as in like Sans, the alcohol, no alcohol, which I have a story about. I love supporting inspiring brands and stories of personal growth and all that. So I bought a case of Sans. Sans? I don't know how we want to pronounce it, but I was so excited to try this drink. And it's not like you can buy one can. You have to like buy a whole case. They got to ship it from California. I'm in New York. So I'm like impatiently waiting because I'm so excited to try Kevin's drink. And I was honestly getting annoyed because I'm like, why is this taking so long? <laughs> I think at the time, this is like right around the time I quit drinking alcohol. But finally, when it arrived, like I said, I was so excited, but they were warm. So I had to put them in the fridge and wait. And again, I'm waiting impatiently. Finally, enough time has passed where I feel like, you know, it's at its optimal temperature for me to try this drink. I take one sip and I'm livid. <laughs> but hear me out, okay? It was totally not what I was expecting. And I don't know, I don't even know what I was expecting, but I was expecting like glory to touch my lips as soon as I took that first sip. Instead, I was so angry that I waited and that I was so hyped that I left a bad review. Like I I never, I don't think I've ever done that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I am so embarrassed about this. Okay. And I'll tell you why. I still, so I drink the first one. I'm pissed. I write a bad review because I'm unhinged, you know, and I still have like 11 cans left. And I'm like, mother. <laughs> I'm like mad about it. I'm like, what the, what the hell am I going to do with these now? And I don't know why. I think maybe I ran out of kombucha or something, but I decided to give it another try. I was like hate drinking the fucking thing. Okay. So I forced myself to drink a second can. Then I forced myself to drink a third can. By then I'm like, you know what? These aren't that bad actually. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm like mad at my kid for taking one without asking me and I'm like craving them. So basically Kevin got me addicted to his drink sans. But the moral of the story is I now love Kevin's drink sans and you should all go get it, try it. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed of myself. I hate myself. <laughs> all right, let's talk about this interview with Dan and Kevin. So obviously Dan and Kevin were on the traders together. Dan was the first traitor to be banished. Kevin was murdered not too long ago and almost made it to the end. I would say Kevin played a decent game at the end of the day, despite everyone calling him dumb and stupid. Sorry, DNS. We're not allowed to say those words. So in this interview, Kevin says the biggest difference between Bling Empire and the traitors is that Bling Empire was filmed over a whole span of a year. Also, he gave more insight into his personal life before Bling Empire and how he got on the show. And I just want to say some of y'all been hating on Kevin, but I am going to double down on being a loyal stan. He revealed his struggles before the show with alcohol and that he suffered from alopecia. I did not know that. That is brand new news. He even talked about how like patches of his hair were just like falling out. And he's assuming it's from stress and, you know, his life was not quite together at the time. Something else I didn't know about Kevin until this interview is that he did TED Talks about Asian representation in media. I love that. 
that led to Bling Empire. And that's why he was the only one who was broke on the cast. But Kevin does touch on his drinking problem and how, like, when his rock bottom moment was. And he said it was in 2015. It was after the breakup with his girlfriend, who he wound up getting back together with on the finale, the final season of Bling Empire, which is so cute. They're so cute. At one point in the interview, when Kevin is talking about the time in his life when he was struggling, Dan asks, was going back home to your parents ever an option? All right, first off, I've grown to like Dan outside of the traders, but this is giving off major WMS vibes. I'm not going to get into that, but I'm giving a public service announcement now. If you are an adult and are capable of working, please don't move back to your parents' house. This feels like a white thing to me. Just saying, and I can say that because I'm half white. So Kevin is Korean, but has a white father. And after Dan asked this question, Kevin was like, oh no, for my dad, it wasn't an option. Apparently his father told him he couldn't live there since he wasn't like really doing anything and he didn't want to enable him. Rightfully so, this seems like good parenting to me and it clearly worked because look at Kevin now. But something that I thought was interesting was when Kevin said he thinks Asian parents would love their kids to move back home. And while I'm sure that's the case for many people, regardless of their ethnicity, I just want to tell you all that that is not true across the board. I'll give you a personal story. Yesterday was my birthday. If you don't know, now you know I'm a birthday monster. My mom offered to make me dinner and asked what I wanted. I literally was like, I don't care as long as the kids are fed and I don't have to be the one to feed them because I am tired. All I wanted for my birthday this year was to not be abused by my children. So we have dinner at my parents' house. We have cake. I lay on the couch to relax for a minute. Maybe I was there longer than a minute. But next thing you know, I hear my mother go, okay, Jenny Pa, you can take your kids and go. So there, there you go. Receipts, proof, timeline, screenshots. If anyone listening loves Shaw's of Sunset, you'll know that my mother gives major Vita June vibes. Mercedes, your face is the color of wood. Moving on. Dan asked Kevin what he's noticed since he stopped drinking. So what I realize is if I don't have drinking, I have to deal with my emotions. And then when I realized what my emotions and I gained a lot more of emotional intelligence since I stopped drinking, I realized, oh, shit, like, I, I don't know how to live like a man. I don't know how to live in this world. That is what I love about Kevin. The transparency and vulnerability that he gives us insight into like that. I feel very grateful for that. And what he came to the conclusion of was that he really, you know, he had to figure out what his purpose was. And he thought back to when he was younger and he said he really wanted Asian guys on the map in entertainment because he grew up being the only Asian guy. And I love this story already. He even goes, you know, there's like Bruce Lee and Karate Kid. And he, he's like, that's cool, but I don't know martial arts. This is why I love Kevin. He's like unintentionally hilarious. He goes, why aren't there like sexy Asian guys getting the girls? And he said girls would say to him, oh, I don't date Asian guys. And I have literally heard people say that before. So he basically says, you know, he has a story and a mission. And that's what led him to TED Talks. Dan asked him, you know, who could you talk to about being Korean, essentially? And he said back then he didn't know how to articulate his feelings. He would take things very personally. It impacted his self-esteem. His white friends would even say, well, you're not really Asian. And I posted about this on social media because I've heard that before from both sides. <laughs> I'm mixed. So I have... Most of the time when I meet Asian people, they think I look full white. And then when I meet white people, they usually think I look full Asian. And there's just a lot of preconceived notions that come along with that. And the, those are like heavy 
labels to wear, you know, and just enter a room and be like, hi, I'm me. But then just by the look of me, you already have preconceived notions about me. They also talk about dating. Dan asked, what would you tell a 15 year old Asian guy today? He goes, well, I would just tell them to have the comeback. If a girl says, I don't date Asian guys, then just say, well, you're missing out. But he also touched on, you know, his perspective on interracial relationships, which, I mean, I'm a product of an interracial relationship. My parents are still together. It's been like, Jesus, 40 something years, almost 50. But Kevin, I kind of, I love this part in the interview. And this is, like I said, you know, we all initially hated Dan and maybe some of you still do from watching the show, but I got to interview him and we've talked offline. So now I feel like, I don't know. I think I like Dan. I don't know. But Kevin asked Dan, how many Asians are in your town, Dan? And it's like, I don't know. I have to look it up. And I just, I, I like that he kind of called him out. It's like, hey, you know, like, look at yourself. <laughs> so. Kevin is talking about, you know, Asian representation in media. Dan mentions crazy rich Asians and asked Kevin, did things change for you after that movie came out? And Kevin said everything changed. He got more job offers. People go up to him by saying, I listen to K-pop to try to relate to him. And it makes me laugh because that literally happens to me all the time. Or they'll be like, oh, I really love kimchi. I'm sure I do it too. So I'm not hating on that. It's just, it's funny. It's cute when people do that. They also talk about Joy Luck Club. And I, did I read that? I definitely watched the movie. And I think I read the book before I watched the movie. You mentioned how it took too long to get another Asian cast on mainstream film. And I can't help but Notice the parallels between Kevin's goal and my goal with Bravo and Blaze, where my goal was to bridge a gap between mainstream pop culture media and the true cannabis industry as an extension of health and wellness. It seems like Kevin's goal is to bridge a gap between mainstream pop culture media and proper Asian representation. I love that. <laughs> he also brings up a good point about Hollywood. He says how there's always been a demand for Asian featured entertainment. Do you know how serious K dramas are in Korea? If you don't know now, you know, like it's no joke. My mother started a, an Asian grocery store, like a local small business years ago, decades ago. And part of the business that her brother now owns, they, they would like, rent out VHS tapes of K-dramas because they weren't available on like, we didn't have Netflix and stuff like that. That was like a big source of revenue going in and out. It's like blockbuster. That's why we need to look at the people calling the shots in Hollywood. And it's not just about race. If you watch the documentary, This Changes Everything, it's about the organization that Gina Davis founded that essentially the goal is to show the data, and we're not making this up, facts around the statistics of media. They talk about how many Academy Awards have been won by women. It's very low. I mean, look at what just happened this year with Barbie and Ken getting nominated or winning and not Barb. Like, it goes deep. Okay. So just look it up. <laughs> but that's why I love this new media world because it's similar to the term net neutrality, but it's like media neutrality. The only thing Hollywood has on anyone else going forward in the media landscape is their tenure and their connections. For someone like me, I see that as a challenge. And I want to see others take it as a challenge as well. I think one really amazing case study or example is Tyler Perry. 
He self-funded everything with his Medea productions. And now he's bigger than Hollywood. I don't know if that's actually true, so don't quote me. But if that doesn't prove to you what consistency, ambition, and adversity can do to someone, then I don't know what else to tell you. Dan goes on to ask, you know, how did you get on the TEDx talk? And I love this story. I was kind of floored and I love everything about it. So Jeremy Lin is an Asian basketball player. I remember when he was big time because it was like, oh my God, we have an Asian basketball player. What? Like it was a big deal. And Kevin somehow got a backstage pass to see him through press and like a friend of his. His friend recorded a video of Kevin asking Jeremy Lin, hey, have you ever come across the stereotype that Asian men aren't sexy? And Jeremy Lin riffed off of it and said, you know, it's not something people usually talk about, but he related to it. And from that, that video went viral and a lot of headlines came out after that. Kevin was linked to the article. From there, TEDx reached out to him. Then Huffington Post reached out to him. Then Netflix reached out to him. And I just cannot help but feel like this is a true American dream story. Like, it's so good. I loved it. I love it. But then we go into talking about Bling Empire. Bling Empire came out during the pandemic. I remember that. I was like so excited. Even my brother who doesn't watch any reality TV, he was watching it before I was. He was like, are you watching Bling Empire? Let's watch it. What was interesting, Dan asked, you know, like, how did your life change after Bling Empire? Kevin said he couldn't go anywhere without people approaching him. People even recognized him with a hoodie and a mask on. He said the intensity of, you know, all the fandom actually kind of like ruined it for him. In the end, the show did not renew. Financially, that didn't matter to the rest of the cast. They're like, so rich, it doesn't matter. Kevin, however, was impacted financially. And he said he was kind of nervous at first when it got canceled, but then he got the call for the traders. When he got the call for the traders, it was in the middle of the SAG strike and his agent just released him or his manager. And 20 minutes later, after that happened, he got a call for the traders he said that it wasn't an automatic yes. He said, you know, like tentative yes. Let me just watch the show first. So him and his girlfriend watched, they binged the first season and they were like, oh yeah, hell yeah. One thing he learned about himself on The Traders is that it's okay to be friends with traders. <laughs> Dan asked Kevin, when you got murdered, were you angry? And Kevin's response was, you know, you really feel like you got hit in the heart. You're in a little bit of denial, like, no, they're going to recruit me. And that's truly like he described the stage as a grief. And that's like really sad, but also kind of amazing that it can like evoke that kind of emotional response from someone. Like, it's just a game. I'm obsessed with this show. Anyways, okay. Dan asked Kevin, would you do another reality competition show? Kevin said he doesn't think it's made for him. He said he's tricked really easily. And I could not relate more. I'm like, so am I. But I think I'm okay with that in a game environment. They talked about downtime a lot. Kevin said that was like part of the most favorite thing for him. But it also kind of sucked because they weren't allowed to talk about the game when they weren't filming. Kevin's feedback of the traders from his Bling Empire fans was that a lot of them were disappointed. They said it brought out more of the superficial world instead of like getting to know him personally. And I was so shocked by this feedback. But I... I could see that because on Bling Empire, like I said, you, you learn a lot about Kevin's life. You like fall in love with, like you root for him. You want him to do well. But he then said he thinks he should have been a traitor. <laughs> the thought of Kevin being a traitor makes me laugh so hard. I would have loved to see that. But he is an actor. So maybe he might have done really well. I don't know. Dan mentions his favorite part during the round table when Kevin says to MJ, I find you highly annoying. 
And that's when Kevin goes into the backstory and more insight into what what is the beef between MJ and Kevin? Fortunately, that was really me being real. <laughs> like, <laughs> because you know the thing what it was with MJ, like, and this was stuff not even shot on camera, but like she kept talking to me like she knew me because she knew somebody we knew. And she just like was like, I was like, I don't remember meeting you. And she like, you know what I mean? And then like she kept trying to like get more things out of me. And like I, I was like, MJ, I have no idea what show you're on. I have no idea what you're talking about. And so she kept like repeating some of the things. Then like, you know, she was a little forgetful. I was like, yeah, I, I, we, we didn't meet, you know? And so like, I, I think it's just jet lag and just not, you know, having enough sleep. Wait, you had a mutual friend or you guys had actually met before? Yeah, I, I think it was both. I can't, you know, I'd have to quote MJ on this, but like, I, I just know she just kept talking to me and I was like, MJ, like. But you don't know if you'd met MJ before? You can't remember if you have? I can't remember, but I think she said we did or we at least had mutual friends and then she kept talking about it. Like, He said that he kept getting annoyed because she would talk to him about like a mutual friend and a time they met and he just like was not having it and i have to say if somebody said to me like oh we met before you know blah blah blah, whatever i'm like oh i wouldn't just be like no i don't know you but kevin is like i don't remember you mj <laughs> he's like mj i have no idea what show you're on but he's said he now understands mj more and he doesn't think she's annoying so that was cute he also said he initially was annoyed by Bergie. He said he didn't like him because all he talked about was Love Island. And I find that to be hilarious. He's like, what is up with this kid and Love Island? What is Love Island? And I'm kind of like that too. Like, I don't know. I don't know about that show. I know it exists, but I don't pay attention to it. Dan asked if he would do anything different. He said he would have trusted Trishel and Bergie way more than he did during the game they also talked about the fight the fake fight between peter and kevin and dan said he was at first confused but then very impressed by that strategic move and kevin was like i was confused too i don't know <laughs> I <love it. laughs> so kevin talks about what he's promoting he's working on a new comic book it's going to be out with Webtoon. He also has a self-produced update coming out with his girlfriend. His production company is called All's Production. And they're focusing on YouTube. And the way that Kevin talked about it, Dan made a good point. He's like, you say just YouTube, but like that's uh, that I do YouTube. YouTube is a lot of work. And Kevin described it as, you know, Hollywood feels more like a Rolls Royce, whereas YouTube has no barrier of entry and it's not as exclusive. And that's exactly what I've been saying. Okay, I need to go. But if you're still here, thank you. I'll definitely be covering the finale and reunion next week. So stay tuned. If you still want a recap of episode 10, leave a comment and I'll see how we can get that done. I have blind feedback on the podcast. Social media, I got that, but I need more feedback from you guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Stay lit, y'all. Bye.